Hello and welcome to the Center for Spiritually Integrated Arts, a Centers for Spiritual Living teaching center. I am Reverend Dr. Raymond Anderson. I am the founder and the spiritual director. Now, as you are sitting there joining us, you may have questions, any number of questions, such as, who am I? How did I get here? Spiritually integrated arts means what exactly? What is a teaching center? Well, what about what is centers for spiritual living? What is that? What does that even mean? Or new thought or religious science or science of mind and spirit. You may have any number of questions, questions about this specific community, about the parent organization, CSL, our philosophy, our teaching, our liberation theology, any number of questions. Feel free to send an email. We look forward to connecting more and building our virtual community, our global community. And if you haven't connected yet on social media, feel free to do so. This is your invitation now. Also, did you know that all of our Sunday messages are archived on our YouTube channel? You can watch it anytime. Now, questions about anything, such as joining, becoming a member, what does that mean? What, what does membership entail? And if you live somewhere far and already belong to a spiritual community, can you be a member of more than one? The simple answer is, Yes, you can. Just like you can shop at more than one grocery store, you can attend or be a member of more than one gym. We are building beloved community. So you can do both. You can be a member of both. You can be involved with both. That's what being in spiritual community means. So we welcome you. We invite you. We are so appreciative that you have found this community and that you have joined us today. We bless you. We love you. We welcome you. Live long and prosper. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the rest of our Sunday message. Love you. Connect with you soon. Blessings. Namaste, blessings, and oh, tomorrow's a holiday for a lot of folks, huh? If you are one who celebrates said holiday, which you know what it is, then I wish you happy holidays and Merry Christmas, happy Kwanzaa, happy Hanukkah, all of that, because it's all applicable to what we will be talking about today, this idea of the incredible light of being. 
So, the incredible light of being. This month, the darkness, quote unquote, of the season in the Northern Hemisphere has so many celebrations as it relates to this thing called light. December 8th marks Bodhi Day, celebrating the enlightenment of the Buddha in much of the Buddhist world. The Wiccan tradition of Yule on December 21st honors the passing of the shortest day of the year, remembering the return of light. Christmas celebrates the birth of Jesus, which he really wasn't. Anyhow, anyhow, the light of the world in the Christian tradition. December 26th marks the beginning of both Hanukkah and Kwanzaa. <clears throat> excuse me, with the symbology of candles. And the season of Advent also uses candles as a reminder of the light. Now, what does this have to do with any of us? And how are we invited to honor both the light and the darkness? Well, Dr. Holmes says, if one and trust this message today will be a challenging one, just so you know. If one will have faith in themselves, faith in their fellow people, in the universe, and in God, that faith will light the place in which we find ourselves. And by the light of this faith, we will be able to see that all is good. And the light shed by this faith will light the way for others. Gotcha. But the question is, so faith. Because that's what he was talking about. There's a bunch of stuff in there. If your faith is this, then this. If your faith is that, then this. If your faith is this, then that. But the question becomes, well, got faith? What is faith? Are you faithful or faithless? faith empty? What is faith? It is a complete trust or confidence in someone or something. I have faith in your ability to lead the company. I have faith that once you land, you'll call me. I trust. I have confidence in whatever this is, someone or something. Synonyms, trust, belief, confidence, Conviction, reliance, dependence, and expectation. Got that. So faith is a very interesting energy. So the question isn't, do you got faith? The question is, what do you got faith in? What is, what is or who do you got faith in? Because we have faith, period. It is there. But the question is, where are we placing it? Do you have an expectation of failure? Then that's where your faith is. You have faith in, because it's expectation, that's a synonym. You are expecting failure. You have faith in failure. Abandonment, fear, lack, scarcity, whatever it is. So the question is, is your faith life affirming or is your faith non-life affirming? In the same way that you know we talk about negative and positive negative is bad positive is good well we don't do that here right you know me well enough to know that i talk about is it life affirming or non-life affirming not positive negative is it life affirming does it support the divine magnificence or does it deny one's divine magnificence does it deny human rights does it deny equity and justice so where are you investing your faith what do you have confidence in what do you trust who do you trust now this thing called mind be mindful that we can reprogram our minds in order to reorient our faith in other words if we have non-life affirming faith in one area or another we can reorient it so that we now have life affirming faith in whatever it is, relationships, finances, abundance, health and well-being, whatever it is, we can 
reorient, we can reprogram our minds. And one of the ways we reprogram our minds, you'll find out momentarily, by way of this quote from Dr. Holmes, we become conscious of darkness, <clears throat> darkness, Let's jump right in there now. We're going to do a remix of this, but let's highlight a couple of things. We become conscious of darkness only when we are without faith. For faith is ever the light. Keep in mind what we just said about faith. For faith is ever the light of our day and the light of our way. Making the way clearly visible to us, even when to others it may be the be set, it may be beset with obstacles and the ongoing rough. Okay, so we're going to remix this because we're going to remix this. Ready? Reverend Ray's remix of what Dr. Holmes just said. We become engrossed in the fear and conditions of the collective consciousness only when we are without life affirming faith. For life affirming faith is ever the active awareness and practices of evolving consciousness and sacred activism of our day, making the way forward clear and achievable to us, even when to others it may be beset with, yeah, I used his words, it was just a fancy poetic way, even though for others it may have the obstacles and the roughness as associated with maintaining the status quo. So we're not going to do this whole thing about light and darkness as though they are in opposition of one another. Darkness is not the enemy. Lightness or light is not the savior. Keep that in mind as we proceed. So once again, the question is, where am I investing my trust, my faith, my conviction in that which is life affirming or that which is life denying? Breathe. Now, what do you see? If I were to ask you to describe this image, how would you describe it? One such way that you may describe it is spooky, creepy, eerie dark, nighttime, etc. All of this would be accurate. And all of this is how we equate darkness. We equate the darkness with all that is bad, all that is wrong, all that is scary, all that should be avoided. And let us understand that that idea of darkness is a generalized and colonized way of approaching and thinking about the darkness. We're going to talk about why. So breathe. Darkness as defined, right? In general, because there are various ways, but the total or near total absence of light. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a factual scientific way of thinking about it. But darkness is also the quality of being dark in shade or color. Keep in mind how people refer to people of color, dark-skinned. And the darker the berry and red bone, light-skinned, and how colorism shows up because of this. The quality of being dark in complexion. Now, in Latin, the word for black, atter, and to darken, atere, were associated with cruelty, brutality, and evil. So I, as a black person, see how the consciousness begins to, because how does one differentiate? Well, when I'm talking about black people, this isn't what's in my consciousness. And yet it is. You may not realize that it is, but it is. Because that is how insidious the consciousness of the collective as it relates to colonization, that's how insidious it is. The black cat, bad luck. 
the eight ball, the black ball, black magic, most of these things, and including Black Friday, have a certain connotation as relates to. Now, once again, the root of the English words atrocious, atrocity, etc., relate to this idea of black, and black was also the Roman color of death and mourning, which is very closely associated with what? Why we wear black at funerals, etc. But let us continue. Darkness is also that which is gloomy or depressed. Don't be so dark. Think of those who their their appearance is what we would call goth. They're dark. And often they are stereotypically deemed as the brooding, like Wednesday Adams, dark, gloomy, brooding, depressive. Darkness is also associated with evil. The devil is referred to in oftentimes as or Dracula or vampires, the prince of darkness and the agents of darkness. Darkness also is associated with the lack of enlightenment. Synonyms for darkness, black, and blackness. Now, we pause. Because once again, I want to drive home the idea that we have a domesticated idea, an indoctrinated idea of what the darkness is and what light is. What blackness is, what ignorance is, etc. Because ignorance, as it said, the lack of enlightenment, well, that's ignorance. That's you're in the dark. Every time I come to these meetings, I'm always left in the dark. There's a, there's a lack of. So how do we begin to clarify what it is we are actually talking about? To be more specific, language specificity. Dr. Holmes says we cannot see reality, capital R, reality, until our eyes are open. Now, once again, this is metaphor. It's analogy and all this other poetic way of looking at stuff because our eyes have nothing to do with our understanding. Because if that was the case, then those who are blind, they would be lost. There's no way they could ever have understanding or enlightenment because they cannot open their eyes, quote unquote. That leads us to the idea of ableism, if that's the case. So this is a poetic way of referencing the eyes being the window to the soul. And when one's eyes are open, one can, yeah. Anyway, we cannot see reality until our eyes are open, until the light of eternal truth has struck deeply into our souls. Okay, I got you. I got you. We're going. We're going. We're going. Let's let's go to uh, Reverend Doctor Howard Thurman for a moment, and then we're going to sort of summarize. He says, "To continue one's journey in the darkness." Now, keep in mind, Howard Thurman is a black man, but he's also a Christian, and he's using the language and the symbology that he was also subjected to and indoctrinated into. To continue one's journey in the darkness with one's footsteps guided by, actually let's, darkness with one's footsteps guided by the illumination, the light, of remembered radiance to no courage of a particular kind. The courage to demand that light continue to be light even in the surrounding darkness. Ready? Remix. To continue one's journey in the mystery of the unknown with one's life guided by the awareness and the recognition of one's spiritual truth 
which is to know courage of a particular or specific kind, the courage to demand that truth continue to be the guiding principles and practices even in the surrounding experiences that express the opposite of this truth. So when we are talking about this thing called light and darkness, this is what we are talking about. It gives us access to greater language specificity rather than simply referring to light as being sight and dark as being blindness. Light as being wisdom and darkness as ignorance. If you want to refer to ignorance, say ignorance. Because it's easy for all of this stuff, which we are already indoctrinated with, all that is dark, all that is black, all that is is deemed as being the bad, the stuff we should avoid, and all that is light and white and bright, the good the things we should encourage and want. How do we begin to unprogram and reprogram our consciousness? By eliminating these analogies and metaphors and symbolic ways of expressing when the invitation is to be specific. Say what you mean and mean what you say. Now, does that mean we should never be poetic? No, of course not. But it's being mindful that the words we use are communicating something. All communication is to impart or to receive. I am either giving information, sharing information, or I am seeking and receiving and asking. So now poetry is to create an image. Yes, we very well may use, but be mindful that those images and the symbols that are used have a connection to a certain level of consciousness and a certain idea and series of paradigms. Because if we're not mindful of it, then we're going to continue the status quo, which does good in what way? Like, how does that change consciousness? How does that further evolve into a world that works for all? So let's pause and be mindful of how our implicit biases may be showing up in the words that we use as they refer to the darkness, whether that's darkness of night, darkness of mind, darkness of skin complexion, darkness of whatever. Let's Be more conscious and aware. Dr. Sean Jinwright, author of The Four Pivots, I highly recommend, and we may be doing a book study group here at our center. Be mindful and remember. He says, clarity comes when we shed all barriers, confusion, distractions, amusements, and excuses that get in the way of what we really want. Barriers, confusion, distractions, amusement, and excuses that get in the way of what we really want. So you want clarity? Well, tell me, what do you really want? How many of us know what we really want? Are we able to communicate what it is we truly want? If I were to say, someone asked me, Ray, what do you what do you want for your birthday? I just want to be loved. What does that really mean? Because the person could very well say, well, I love you. I know you love me, but. So what exactly do you want? How many of us in that frame of reference, it's. I want to be seen. I want to be heard. I don't feel that I have the capacity to express what I want to express, which I'm equating with love. Love means say what you need to say. Love means you want a hug, ask for a hug. Love means whatever that is, am I clear enough to be able to communicate that? You, what, do you, what do you want? You want to hit the Powerball. You want to make a million. You want to be a millionaire. 
Why? What do you want? You don't simply want the money. You want what the money affords you the ability to do. So what do you really want? I want economic freedom. Yeah. But what does that mean? I want the freedom to be able to live on my terms. How do we develop this language specificity to actually mean what we say and say what we mean? Rather than this. And then I'm expecting you to understand that this means this instead of me just saying this. So what do you want? This holiday season, what do you want? What do you want to experience? What do you want to be in the world? What do you want to do? What do you want? Reverend Dr. Howard Thurman says, we seek to walk. Once again, an analogy referencing, well, what about those in a wheelchair? What about those who cannot, quote unquote, walk? So we equate walking with, right? once again, the metaphor and the way of using symbols to convey motion and change. And we seek to walk in our own path, which opens up before us, made clear by the light of the Christ spirit. In a minute. And the radiance which it, the Christ spirit, which it casts upon us. Okay. The Christ spirit, once again, he's speaking from the paradigm as a Christian, as a Christian minister. So our invitation within New Thought and specifically within religious science, science of mind and spirit is, what are the other options? What are some other options so that we are not in a Christian supremacist paradigm where it's always about Yeshua or the Christ consciousness? Because there are others, Buddha consciousness, Buddha nature. There are many other, many others. So rather than being specifically a westernized idea of, let's expand it and recognize in the same way that how many species of apples are there. It doesn't have to just be Macintosh. There are others, Granny Smith. Red Delicious, there are many others. So let's expand this into the awareness of and the conscious of consciousness of the divine spirit as it expresses through whomever, whatever, however we want to express that, the great spirit, Mother Earth, Grandfather Sky, however we want to express it, but know that there are others. This guy, what's his, what's his name? Rev, Reverend Ray, I'm not sure who he is, but he says, <laughs> as a metaphysical liberation theology, science of mind and spirit offers us the means to decolonize new thought and the collective consciousness of non-life affirming biases. So let's explore the ways that we can be open at the top and the bottom by balancing yin, yang, darkness and light, feminine and masculine. Let us reorient and reinvigorate the teaching, making it applicable and relevant to the world. Breathe. This week's affirmation or declaration, I will say it first, and then if it resonates with you, say it with me on the second go round. I am the light embodied. I am radiantly radiating. This great light of mine, I now let it shine. This divine light of mine, it now shines as me. Together. I am the light embodied. I am radiantly radiating. So it is. This week's journal questions or for the Thursday night study group. 
Where do I let my light shine and where do I tend to turn my light down? What do I need to release so that I may radiantly radiate this light more fully? Number two, do I really believe, based upon my life's results, that I am the light of God? I am the light that is God. The light that is God is incarnating as me. Do I really believe that, based upon my life's results, based upon what we see if we look at my life, do I really believe this? And what is this light in real life world? In what is this light? in practical, real world terms. So when I say, where do I let my shine or show up? Where do I let my, what? what is that? What is light? Is that creativity? Where do I let my creativity shine? Where do I let my love shine? Where do I let my joy shine? What is light? In a practical, real world term, what is your light? Number three. How do I use faith? What do I really have faith in? Again, based upon my life's experiences and my life's results, what do I have faith in? And is my faith life affirming or life denying? Number four, what is the way that I can share my light with others during this season and beyond? And then lastly, Am I willing to honor the darkness and learn from it without letting it extinguish my light? What does that even mean? Am I willing to honor the darkness, sadness, grief? What is your darkness? Uh, Darkness is that the shadow self, the part of us that we don't want to acknowledge and whatever that is. The darkness, the mystery, the place from whence all things come from. It is the womb of creation, but it is not meant to be static or stagnant. It is meant to birth. But if we recede into the cocoon and never emerge, then what? what's the point? So it's this process. So am I willing to honor this unknown, the mystery, and learn from it without becoming so obsessed that it denies the other aspects of my life. I become so obsessed with yin that I forget about yang. How do I balance them? And then lastly, at the very bottom, there's a link for you to visit the implicitharvard.edu test to see what some of your implicit biases may be. Now, let us anchor into that space of prayer. Pause and breathe. And so we pause, we breathe, we anchor and ground into this space where the divine light and darkness coexist as one power, one presence, one energy. Yin, yang, together. One. They're not separate. They're one. Yin. Now we say yin and yang, but it's one. Me, myself, and I. Is that three? No, it's one. The divine trinity of my being. The divine duality of darkness and light is oneness. So we anchor and ground into this space of seemingly duality, or even the duality that is expressed in our everyday real-world experiences, and yet, back of that, there is still oneness. One breath that is involved in respiration of inhale and exhale. You separate and there's only an inhale, that's not breathing. Only an exhale, that's not breathing. Breathing, respiration, is the inhale and the exhale and the pause between where the inhale stops and the exhale begins and stops. So that yet another inhale. 
so that yet another exhale. The ongoing process of respiration, the ongoing process of inspiration, the ongoing process of the creative impulse of all that is as it lives, moves, and has its beingness right where we are. So this holiday season, this season of what is holy, recognizing the holy days, are not just for specific times of year. We can honor specific times of year, such as a birthday, such as a Christmas, a Hanukkah, such as we can honor a Thanksgiving, such as we can honor specific days. Yes, and yet recognizing that every day is a holy day because every day is a day that the divine is present. In the same way that when I was a Christian, we would say, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Well, this is the day that the universe is expressing itself in, through, and as all that is. And so I celebrate my part in this, and I rejoice, and I choose to be glad and grateful in this process of the universe ever being in motion as itself in, through, and as me as well. Yes, this is the day that that which is the Lord of my consciousness creates and co-creates and participates in the process of life. And I rejoice and am glad in my ability to participate in, to change structures, to bring greater equity and justice to the world to love others, to listen. I rejoice and am glad in it. So we breathe because that is our invitation to rejoice and be glad in the holy day that is every day, in the light and the darkness that is every day, that is the part of our being that births new, evolving consciousness. Moment by moment, breath by breath, thought by thought. So we celebrate this entire creative process. We release and re we relinquish the consciousness that is no longer serving us, the consciousness of colonization, the consciousness of whatever is non-life affirming. We surrender, we release it, we let it be eradicated and removed. We are no longer in the 18th century. We are in the 21st century. So we live from the space of now. No longer carrying the skeletons of what once was. We live in the now. No longer carrying the biases, implicit or explicit, of yesteryear. We live in the now. We celebrate the now. We evolve in the now. And so we breathe because the law says yes to all of this and more. And knowing that it says yes, that means it is. It is so. It is done. It is now and it is us. And so it is. Breathe. Namaste, blessings, much love and appreciation. Have an amazing whatever it is that you celebrate. And we'll see you very soon.